So Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we'll start there. And of course, like I said, you know, this is Valentine's Day, and so then everybody is going to talk about Valentine's Day and love and all that stuff. And what I want to do is take a look at, in some of Paul's epistles, and I don't know how long this will take, I'm not going to be able to go through every verse, obviously, that has to do with it, but there's a few things that I want to be able to pull out so we can kind of get an idea. Um, and it starts off here in Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Notice it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a bunch of stuff there that we could get into, but we'll, we'll do that as we go through Romans when we get there. He says, By whom, and of course in the context there is Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. And of course, one of the things that we want to talk about here is where it says, why is it that we are able to have our hope make us not to be ashamed? Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, by the Holy Ghost, there's a there's there's a there's a ministry that the Holy Ghost has, and it's not the the tongue talking ministry that a lot of people have. It's something completely different. The ministry of, of of the Holy Ghost right now is to take those things that are in in God's Word that you have built up that body of doctrine that you've built up in your body and in your soul and in your mind that the Holy Spirit's going to take those words that you've read and studied and understood and He's going to apply those in your life as you live day by day. And that's what He's supposed to do. So what we're talking about here really is because of the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. And of course one of the things we were talking about was the Scriptures. Right? We, we were talking about the fact that um, you know I was in the uh, Christian bookstore yesterday and I'm going through and I'm listening to all these conversations that people are having about well I want this Bible or I want that Bible and they, they you know the, the young lady that that picks it out based upon the color of the outside of it being purple because that's the one that she wanted because it was purple had have no clue what the contents inside was or the purpose of the contents inside that wasn't anything that she cared about and of course you know you're five six seven years old that's understandable, but when you have older people come in and they want to get parallel Bibles and say, well, I want one that's got King James and NIV or King James and ESV or ESV and NIV or whatever it may be, and they want these parallel Bibles, they have no clue what's going on. And it was it was kind of, kind of sad because, you know, people are coming in here to a Christian bookstore and they expect to be able to be told information that would help them decide which which Bible that they are supposed to choose. And, you know, when it comes down to readability and we, we talk about all that stuff, okay. <clears throat> uh, when we talk about the readability and all that, you know, the King James Bible is, is written on a fourth grade a fourth grade reading level. And, you know, that means if you're in fourth grade or higher and you're able to read at grade level, then you can read and understand the book. You don't have to have the thought for thought translation, which is one of the things that the lady at the bookstore was saying to, the, to an elderly woman, saying, well, this is more thought for thought, and she was trying to show her uh, different versions of one particular verse, and she said, you know, it's Psalm something, and then she pulled her to another one and said, well, look at this, John 3.16, this is one that everybody knows. And for the most part, the one that everybody has memorized of John 3.16 is the King James Version because that's the one that they whoops, that's the one that they have been taught and as they were growing up. So, you know, there's one thing that I want to look at, John chapter 3, a couple things that we want to understand because what it comes down to is to study your Bible, and that's what we're supposed to do. And we're we're asked to study our Bible. In fact, we're told to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So not only are we told to study, but we're actually told exactly how to study, and that is by rightly dividing the word of truth, and then we can get through all that stuff. But there's a couple things that, that kind of goes along with that. 
one of the things with study is you have to put in time and effort and you have to learn some stuff and it's not that you can go read a passage and understand the thought that the author had I mean this isn't Shakespeare you know this isn't Shakespeare this is the Word of God this was spoken by the mouth of God to all of his holy apostles and prophets and then they wrote those words down so that you and I could have God's Word and there's little things like you know John chapter 3 verse 7 uh, this is one thing that I always want to try and bring up because this is this is very clear if you look at this John chapter 3 verse 7 it says marvel not that I say, said unto thee ye must be born again so of course this is a passage that a lot of people come along and they try to figure out okay what exactly is it that this this is talking about now the problem is is in modern translations the word you it would be read as marvel not that I said unto you you must be born again well the problem with that in the English language is is we don't have a way to designate am I talking about you personally or you as a whole okay the English language originally which is what this was written in in 1611 they had a way to tell the difference between you personally and you into and you corporately total everybody and so that's what's going on here so if you read this verse it says marvel not that I said unto you you must be born again well if you read that in modern translations what's that say don't marvel you personally don't marvel because you should be born again and so then this whole doctrine of being born again comes about well when you actually understand what's going on here and understand that the is the singular version of you and ye is the plural version of you to say if you really want to put this in modern vernacular it would be marvel not that I said unto you Nicodemus all of you Israel must be born again because that's exactly what he's talking about here when he's talking about ye and thee that's what he's dealing with it's not you personally don't marvel you you yourself personally need to be born, born again what he's talking about here he says there is a thing that the entire nation of Israel must be born again okay and there's a whole doctrinal and dispensational purpose of why he says that to them for that particular time but that's not the issue here but my, my point is is in the English language today if I said you do you know if I'm talking to you personally or you as everybody well the only way that we can do that would be to say you all or all of you right and that's the problem because we don't really have a way to designate you as two different words one plural and one singular but the original English language that this was written in in 1611 did one word the is the singular and ye is the plural so when we get that idea then if we understand really what's going on then the Holy Spirit can come and do his job and the whole point of this is that the Holy Spirit can come and do his job all right so the verse that everybody wants to talk about when you talk about love is John 3 16 so let's take a look at verse 14 first so this is like I said right on the heels of Jesus Christ speaking to Nicodemus verse 14 it says and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life so if you believe on him you're gonna have eternal life you're not gonna perish you're not gonna die but you're gonna have eternal life well how does this take place notice in verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life for God sent his son into the world to for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved he that believeth on him is not condemned but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God so let me ask you a question what's the issue there what are they supposed to believe in the name of the only begotten Son the Son of God it's not it's not for God so loved the world that he sent his son to die on the cross for your sins so that he would be buried and that he be rose again the third day for your justification 
That's not what this context is talking about. This context is talking about the fact that Israel, your Messiah, is here. You have to accept him because this is the key in verse 18. It says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. Why? Why did he not believe? What did he not believe in? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So that's the issue there. It's not that they didn't believe that he was crucified, was buried, and rose again. That's not the issue in John chapter 3 verse 16. However, if we go back over to Romans chapter 5, we find out something completely different. Okay? Notice what we have in Romans chapter 5, because this is one of the things that we want to make sure that we get. Because there's a big difference in God so loved the world that he, that he sent His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him believed what? That He was the Son of God. Now, Romans chapter 5, verse 5. <clears throat> and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The Holy Ghost teaches us about the love of God. Well, how do we, how do we know about the love of God? It's shed abroad in our hearts. And we have to be able to read and understand what's going on. Let's continue on. For, because he's going to tell you, this is how, for, when we were yet without strength, the fact that we were helpless, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now, when, when the Holy Spirit here is getting ready to teach us about the love of God and how it shed abroad in our hearts, how does he do it? Does he say, for when we were yet without strength, Jesus Christ became the Son of God, and you should believe that He is the Son of God. That's not what it's talking about, is it? He says, For when we were without, yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. That's you and I. He died for the ungodly. Notice verse 7. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But... God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ became the Son of God. Is that what that verse says? The answer is absolutely not. It says, but God commendeth his love toward us. God showed his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's something different than what you just read in John chapter 3 verse 16 and don't you dare read Romans 5 into John 3 16. Everybody does. Everybody does. You can go preach to somebody John 3 16 and somebody can say I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and guess what they're gonna die and go to hell because they've not trusted in the proper gospel. They are believing another gospel which is not another but some people come along and they pervert the gospel of Christ to lead you away from the truth. And there's people today, right now, at this present time, that believe that they're going to go to heaven and they're not because they're believing the wrong thing. But pastor said so. It doesn't matter because the Holy Spirit says so in the book. This is what you're supposed to believe. Alright? Now, continue on. It didn't stop there. Notice what it says in verse 9. Much more then. Alright. So you think it's enough that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that's God's love and that's all where it stops. No. He says much more then being now justified by His blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, notice that doesn't say that we will be saved through wrath, that we have to go through the wrath and God's going to protect us as he takes us through that wrath. No, it says from. The fact that we have been promised that we will not go through the tribulation period. We are promised that we would be perfected by God's word, not that we would be protected through the tribulation. Because that's not what it is. We're not going to be here. We don't have to be protected and preserved like the little flock is 
as they go through that tribulation period. We've been promised to be perfected now so that we could go and become the things that He wants us to do, not protected to go through the tribulation period. 4, verse 10, If when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, notice, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Now, you have original salvation in the fact that Jesus Christ died for you. We have future salvation through that, from that wrath. But we also have this future salvation in the fact that we shall be saved by His life. Well, how are we saved there? We're saved from sin and wrath. The fact that we have been saved from sin and the fact that we will be saved from wrath, that's exactly what we have. Notice what he says, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom, notice, we have now at this present time received, past tense, the atonement. You've already got it. There's nothing that we're lacking. That's what God's love is all about. <clears throat> all right? Um, go over to Romans chapter 8. Because this is the one that everybody loves. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Paul says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to the purpose, according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called he justified, and them he justified, he also glorified. What shall we say to these things if God be for us, who can be against us? He spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is it that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Okay, Skip down real quick. He's talking about some other things. So we can get down to verse 39. He says, or verse 38 says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. All right? So there's a whole bunch of stuff in this passage. One thing is, when we first start off here in Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. So then if you really want to know what God's love is all about, we have to understand what are the all things He's talking about there. And we can't get into the context because there's a whole bunch of stuff there. The main thing that I want you to get is that verse doesn't say that God puts you through things to get your faith to better or anything like that. That's not what it says. He says all things, he's going to work all things together for good to them that love God. So if you love God, so everybody's like, well, how do you know you love God? Well, you just, you just show it by doing things. And that's not what it is. That's never how you show God's love. How do you show God's love? By understanding what His love is about and understanding what you're supposed to be doing in this dispensation of the grace of God. And understand who you are and what you are, what you have, and who you will be in Christ. Because that's what it comes down to in verse 39. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Where's God's love? Which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Where's His love? His love's found right there. All right? And the good thing is, is Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God. He's right there with him. He also makes intercession for us. So it's not that he's going to put you through things to make you a better person or to prove that you love him, because that's how a lot of people read that verse. The all things there is talking about the all things previous that he's talking about in the, the whole thing of chapter 8. And like I said, without context, we're not going to get into it. As we go through Romans, we'll deal with that. But the thing I want you to understand is, is where is God's love found? Where is it found? 
It's found in Christ, what Christ did. Not who he was, that he was born in a manger and, and grew up and, and went into the synagogues and, and preached to people for three years and baptized people and healed people and fed people with fishes and loaves and did all that stuff and all that. That's not the gospel of, the, of Christ right now is God's love shown through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's where his love is found. Nowhere else. For you today, living in this dispensation, that's the only place that you can find it. Okay? Um, <clears throat> we're about 21 minutes in. Let's keep going. Romans chapter 12. The big key that I want you to understand is, is without Christ, God, we don't have love. And how do we find love now is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's in Him. That's how we have it. Romans chapter 12. Start off in verse 1 because this is kind of the context of really what's going on. Notice he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may be that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, what he has to do here is what he's talking about is the same thing we started off in Romans chapter five. How are you going to be transformed? You're going to be transformed by the Word of God because the Holy Spirit He teaches us how the love of God is shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to teach us that. He's going to be the one that renews our mind. He's the one that's going to be, be able to bring these scriptures up and bring them up in our minds so that we know how to act in certain situations and that we would not be conformed to the world but be conformed to the doctrine that we have in Romans through Philemon. Why? So that we might be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. So then he continues on down talking about this one body that we have, that we're all members of this one body and that we're all members of this body in Christ. Okay. Then in verse 7, pick up in verse 7. <clears throat> he says, Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, that he, he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love with, be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. All right? What he's saying here is don't, don't let love be in your life without faith. And that's really what he's talking about here. Specifically talking about truth. Understanding the truth that we have, being able to do that. And that's what he's talking about here. Notice what he says. Be kindly affectioned one to another. If you want to know what it means to love somebody, there you go. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, waiting or patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, disturbing uh, dis distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality, bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things, but can uh, condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. And then he continues on talking about some more things of here's how it looks for you to be to show love to other people, to show the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. First of all, you have to understand where did that love come from and how are we going to be able to take that and without dissimulation, by allowing that to work by the truth, how do we do that? Well, this is how. And everybody always talks about, well, you grace people and you right divide people. All you care about is your chart and you never have anything that's practical. Well, right there it is. You read the verse, go do it. People ask me, well, what do you, what do, you do about um, missions? What do you do about feeding the poor? There's five of us. We have no money. We don't take up money. We just do what the verses say because that's free. Call me crazy, but that's free. 
You don't have to have tons of money. I mean, there's a local church that I follow with our Grace, our Crosswork Ministries on Twitter. And one night, it just one tweet after another, this is how much money that we raise to give to this Baptist missionary. And this is how much money we raise. Who are you glorifying? You're glorifying yourself. You can fake it and say that you're glorifying God and, and Jesus Christ and what he did, but you're glorifying yourself. Every time that they send a tweet out, this is the percentage that we took up to give to the Baptist people so that we can stay Baptist. This is how much we gave to this missionary so they can go... You've got people dying around you going to hell and that's free to just talk to them. That's your missionary work. Your neighbor. Not somebody in a different country. This is how you show it. Right here. This is what it looks like. And as I've said before, I'm just dumb enough to believe what the verses say and allow that to be the thing that... that motivates how do you do it you show patience and and hospitality and you continually in prayer and you bless them to persecute you and bless and curse not All right there it is you just do what the verses say it's not it's not this magical thing to show somebody love and say you know i saw the gospel of christ as somebody was clapping for somebody that had some sort of that's not what it is. That's not the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is so much more than that. So much more than that. There's so many of these <clears throat> that I want to get to. but um, First Corinthians. This is another one that everybody likes. First Corinthians chapter 2. Second, or First Corinthians chapter 2. This is another one that everybody likes to talk about. <clears throat> Verse 9. <clears throat> But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart the, of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's a true statement. And everybody always says, man, if you just love God, you have no idea what God's going to do for you one day in the future. And, you know, he might, this whole click this or repost this and God's going to bless you in 24 hours on Facebook. God doesn't work through Facebook, folks. He works through a book. It's got 66 books. He wrote it down. He was the one that spoke those words. That's how he works today. And if you really want to understand what it is, read the book because you know what we find out? It's not just some mystical, mythical thing that everybody, you know, all this junk that you have around. It's not that, well, there's just no way to know what all God's done. Do you know why I know that? Because verse 10 says something. Verse 10 says, But God hath revealed them unto us. It's not a mystery. He says, I hath not seen or ear heard, but God's revealed it to you. So guess what? That verse right there has been fulfilled. Now you can see and now you can hear all that God's given you. He says, but God, can, God, God hath revealed them unto us. How? By his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man, which is in him? Even so the image of God, or even so the things of God, knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given unto us, given to us of God. Let me ask you a question. Is there anything in that passage that says that there's no way that we can know what God's given us? Well, if you read the book and you keep on reading verse 10 through the rest of it, it tells you this is how that this is going to take place. Verse 13, he says, Which things also we speak. How can Paul speak about these things that he couldn't see or hear if he had not seen or heard them? The only way that he's able to speak 
Notice he says, not in the world, not in the words which man wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. How does the Holy Ghost teach? Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. If the Holy Ghost doesn't have verses in your mind and in your soul to work with, you're not going to be able to put these things together. You're not going to be able to understand God's Word because He does not work apart from His Word. You have to, what we just got through reading in Romans chapter 12, you have to put this in your mind. Paul talks about the fact that we have this book and it's, it works effectually in those who believe because that's the purpose of the book. That's how it's designed. The book is a living thing. It's not, it's, not, it's not something that completely changes over time. It's never going to change, which is why it's so important for you to have a book that never changes. And it's amazing to see because <clears throat> when we actually understand what's going on, things make so much more difference in our lives because we see how this stuff works. Okay? We'll go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Because once you kind of get this information built up into you, then this verse happens. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 14. Notice he says in verse 14, For the love of God, or the love of Christ, constraineth us. All right? So the four there has to take us back to all the other stuff. Well, what's he talking about and all this other stuff? Well, he's talking about the fact that <clears throat> we have this earthly tabernacle with which the Holy, Holy Ghost, God the Father, God the Son, Holy Ghost dwell within, that we have this, that we've been given this Holy Ghost. He's the, he's the earnest of the, of the Spirit. We have all this information and the fact that we are this tabernacle. And Paul talks about the fact that it would be better for him. He would say, he said, I, I, uh, I say and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. But he talks about the fact that we're going to have this. And not only that, but he's working in us to do these things. So that verse 10, for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And then he continues on talking about what's going to take place there. And then he comes along and he says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. He talks about the fact that the love of Christ constrains us because we know that if Jesus Christ died for all, then everybody was dead and he had to do that. Notice he doesn't say, For the love of Christ constraineth us because he was the Son of God. And that we have to believe that He was the Son of God. He's talking about the fact that Jesus Christ died for all, then all were dead. Notice, and He says, And that He died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. And then He continues on talking about that. So what's the key here? The love of Christ constrains us. We have to know something about the love of Christ. Not just the fact that He was born, not just the fact that he lived. Not just the fact that he went and spoke in synagogues. Not just the fact that he rose the dead, healed the lepers, cleansed the sick, and all this other stuff. Cleansed the lepers, healed the sick, and did all that stuff. But it's so much more than that because do we, right now, are we able to take what he says in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John about the feeding and the healing and the cleansing and all that stuff. Do we partake in that? There's no way we can. But we're given something so much better than that. But so many people are dumbfounded and they get caught up in all this physical stuff and they look for this physical stuff constantly and we miss so much of what His love really means. The greatest card that you can get on Valentine's Day is right here, 66 books, written down in the King James Bible. And then you open that up and you read the books, Romans through Philemon, and you find out about the love of Christ that He died for us. And that love constrains us to go tell people. 
Because we understand that he, if he died for all, then all are dead. And that they which should live should not henceforth, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We understand this ministry of reconciliation that we have, that we should go forth and teach the people and tell the people, this is what the love of Christ looks like. It's not the fact that he was born in a manger. It was the fact that he was crucified. He took your sin payment on the cross of Calvary. He took your punishment. He took my punishment. And that's what we have. And we allow that word of God to dwell in us richly. And then that controls what we do. And once we get there, go over to Rome, or Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> once we get to that situation, we understand how this works and we allow God's love and, and the love of Christ to constrain us and God's love to live in us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we understand the fact that we are sons of God. The fact that we have been baptized by the Holy Spirit into the, mem the, the mem as a member of the body of Christ. Here's what's going to take place. Galatians chapter 5. We'll start in verse... <clears throat> We'll start in verse 16 because this is, this is really what's going on here. Notice what he says. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Okay? So if you really want to know what it means to walk in the, in the lust of the flesh, then read the verses right before this. He's going to tell you a little bit more of it right here. He says, verse 17, For the flesh lusteth, lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, one, uh, contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would but if ye be led of the spirit ye are not under the law now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these and he's going to tell you here's what it looks like <clears throat> if you're walking in the spirit and everybody talks about you know well we want to take a look at your fruit and find out are you doing certain things? Are you tithing? Are you baptized? Are you doing this? Are you doing that to show whether or not you're saved? Because that's the big question. Am I saved or not? People want to know. How do I know if I'm saved? Well, let's find out. <clears throat> if you're walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit, this is how he's going to do it. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I told you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So if you're walking in the flesh, you can easily look, watch TV for 30 minutes, and you can find all these people who are living in the flesh. It probably wouldn't even take 30 minutes. Five minutes you can figure it out. Probably less than that. Every TV station you flip to, that's what they're promoting. And then we wonder why our, our country is in the situation it's in because this is what we're promoting as a nation. But notice what verse 22 says. But the fruit of the Spirit. Now, I want to stop there real quick because a lot of people want to talk about the fruit. And they say the fruit, well, that's one thing. And they say the fruit of the Spirit is love. And they say the fruit of the Spirit is love. And then out of love comes all these other things. And they say that because the word fruit there is singular. But how many times, if you have a bowl of fruit, you could have bananas and apples and oranges and things like that and say this is a bowl of fruit. You don't say bowl of fruits. So think of this as a bowl of fruit. He's not just saying the fruit of the Spirit is love, this one thing, and then everything comes out of that. This is what he says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are in that are Christ have um, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. 
And then he continues on talking about this is how you help somebody if they're taken in a fault and they do fall into one of those previous things, the adultery and all that stuff that we just read. If somebody falls into it, there's a way to get them out and be able to teach them. He says, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is something that is so much greater than the law that was given to Moses. And if it hadn't been for Paul's epistles, you wouldn't understand what the law of Christ is. The law of Christ is, bear the burdens of other people. People want to talk about all the time where Jesus Christ tells his disciples and those around him saying, Pick up your cross and follow me. You have to bear your cross. And then I, I hear people say, well, you know, my car broke down, so that's my cross to bear. That's not what he's talking about. In that context, he was talking about, you have to give up your life during the tribulation period. You might have to give up your life during that tribulation period because that's what was getting ready to happen. But here he's talking about something else. Jesus Christ bore your burden of sin and bore your burden of just judgment. But here he's saying, bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think of himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Now when he's talking about here, he's like, if you see somebody that's not following the fruit of the Spirit, you can... Help them out. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what the love of Christ, it constrains us to help these people out, to help bear their burdens. And that's what he's talking about here. And then he continues on talking about sowing and reaping and all that stuff. Okay. <clears throat> like I said, I don't know if we'll get through all these. I mean, there's there's so many that we want it that I want to get to. But I mean what it comes down to is on this day that we've set aside Hallmark, whoever you want to blame, um, love was shown on a cross. And there's no card, there's no candy, there's no gift that could ever come close to the love that God's shown us through Christ. There's no other love that, there's nothing that could compare to the love that Christ show, has shown us on that cross. We try every day, but we can't. And that's, that's the point. One last thing I want to get. Um, <clears throat> Ephesians 1, because this kind of brings it all together, I think. Ephesians chapter 1, <clears throat> we'll start in verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And this is exactly how this is going on. But notice, going down to verse 15. He says, Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul looks at these folks in Ephesus and says, I've heard of your faith, and I understand how you love one another, and I pray for you constantly. He said, you're always in my thoughts. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling, what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And then he continues on talking about the fact that which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities and powers and might and dominions and every name that is named, not in this world, but also in that which is to come. And he shows you this is the fullness of his love of what he accomplished. 
through His love. And like I said, there's so many other verses that we could go through and get all this, but what it comes down to is the fact that God showed His love in that while we were yet, in, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, so that we could understand His love, so that we could live His love out, work that love out among those around us, specifically with the mem members of the body of Christ, but also with those who are who are without. But to understand this is what this is what we're here for. The love of Christ constrains us to do those things, so that maybe one day people could look at you and say, hey, that person's nothing but love. And that's exactly what we hope to attain to because that's our purpose. That's what we're supposed to do so that people would look at us and say, that's exactly what love looks like. Okay. <clears throat> Again, uh, like I said, there's a bunch of stuff just for time's sake. We won't go into everything, but we thank you for joining us. Uh, let's end off with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we have to study your word. May we take those things that we've heard today, apply them to our daily lives so that we can know and understand your love and that we not just allow it to work in our lives, but that we could take it to others as well. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.